Namaste. In today's lecture, let us have a look at the legal aspects of capture and restraint. So, in this lecture, we will have a look at different laws of the country and, and how they relate to the capture and restraint of wild animals. So, we have seen that capture and restraint of wildlife is an integral part of contemporary wildlife management. So, what are the acts that govern this capture of wildlife? The first one is the Indian Forest Act of 1927. Now, in this act, it defines what do we mean by a forest produce and a forest produce includes wild animals and their skins, tusks and other parts and all other parts or produce of the animals. So, essentially, if there is any wildlife that is there in the forest, it is a forest produce. If you are taking it out, then this, the sections of the Indian Forest Act will also apply. Then the acts prohibited. So, hunting, shooting, fishing, poisoning of water and setting of traps and snares. Now, when we say hunting, then hunting involves a number of other activities that will uh, soon come to. Shooting, fishing, poisoning water or setting of, of, of traps and snares. Now, these are the things that we normally use to capture wildlife. So, all of these are governed by the Indian Forest Act. Killing or catching of elephants when we do not have the Elephant Preservation Act. Uh, in areas where we have the uh, where we do not have the elephant preservation act in, in place but then this act this section also permits any act done by the permission in writing of a forest officer or under rule made by the state government so essentially all of these activities are prohibited they are not banned now the difference between banning and prohibition is that if something is banned you can never do it in case something is prohibited then there are a certain sections that would permit you to, to, to do those acts under certain circumstances. So, all of these things are prohibited, they are not banned. Next, we have the power to make rules for the protected forest. So, the government has the power to make rules for regulating hunting, shooting, fishing, poisoning of water, setting of traps and snares. So, basically everything that we looked at in the previous section, the state has the power to make rules regarding those. If there is somebody who contravenes these acts or against whom there is a reasonable suspicion that he or she has contravened the provisions of the act, then there is a power to arrest without warrant. So, essentially all of these sections are cognizable sections, all of these offenses are cognizable offenses. Now, the difference between a cognizable and a non-cognizable offense is that in the case of a non-cognizable offense you need to have a warrant from an executive officer or from a, a judicial magistrate to arrest the person. In these cases, there is a power to arrest without warrant. So, typically those offenses that are very light in nature. So, for instance, there was somebody who was there in a marketplace and then he shouted something foul to me. So, such an offense, it is an offense because th that person has done me some harm, some, uh, uh, some level of mental distress. Uh, has been given to me by shouting, but those offenses will be a non uh, will be a non cognizable offense. So, if I want to get that person arrested, there has to be a warrant for arrest. But in the case of, uh, of, of offenses that have a more graver outcome, for instance, rape or murder or things like that, these uh, come under the, the category of cognizable offenses. So, you do not require a warrant, you can directly go and arrest that person. So, all of these offenses are cognizable offences. Next, the forest officials and the police officials have the power to prevent commission of an offence. So, uh, we can take actions even before an offence has been committed. Then there is a presumption that the forest produce belongs to the government and as we saw before, the wild animals and their produce are forest produce. So, all of those belong to the government and persons are bound to assist forest officers and police officers when they have entered into the forest areas. So, basically if there is a researcher that has entered into our area for immobilizing of an animal for, for any research purpose, then that person is bound to help us to detect or prevent any offenses that might go on in the area. So, this is what the Indian Forest Act says. Now, the Indian Forest Act, Act was not specifically made for wildlife. So, because of that we had another act, the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 
and this would deal with the aspects of wildlife in much greater detail as compared to the Indian Forest Act. Now, in the case of Wildlife Protection Act, uh, section 2 uh, tells us about the animal article which is any article that is made from any captive or wild animal other than vermin. Vermins are those animals that we have specifically declared in uh, schedule 5 of the act that, that these are those animals that, uh, that we can get rid of and there are very small number of animals that are included there. Now, if you look at the definition of hunting under the wildlife protection act, it includes killing or poisoning or any attempt to do, to do that capturing, snaring, trapping, baiting or any attempt to do that, disturbing the eggs or nest of birds, then it also talks about meat. So, meat also includes blood, fat and flesh of any animal. So, basically if somebody is taking out any tissue samples, then that person is taking out meat of an animal out of the protected area. Then weapon includes firearms, hooks, nets, poison, snares, traps or any instrument or apparatus capable of anesthetizing, decoying, destroying, injuring or killing an animal. So, basically if you look at the wildlife protection act, the definitions are very wide. So, hunting also includes things like capturing or trapping of an animal, hunting also includes things like chasing of an animal out there in the forest area. Similarly, when we have a weapon, so anything that is used to capture an animal or that has an ability of anesthetizing an animal, decoying, destroying, injuring or killing an animal is a weapon. So, anything that we use to capture the animal, whether it is an immobilizing gun, whether it is a dart gun, whether it is a firearm, whether it is a hook, hook, a net, poison and this poison also includes the drugs that we are using on the animals, snares, traps and any other instrument or apparatus all of these come in the category of weapons. So, an immobilizing gun is a weapon under this section and also any device that we are using to trap an animal is a weapon. Next is zoo includes rescue centers. Now, section 9 is very important, it prohibits hunting. Here also it is important to note that section 9 prohibits hunting, it does not ban hunting because hunting is permitted in under certain circumstances. So, hunting of wildlife will be permitted under certain cases and who is going to give the permission is the chief wildlife warden of the state. Now, the chief wildlife warden may if he is satisfied that any wild animals is specified in schedule 1 has become dangerous to human life or is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery by order in writing and stating the reasons. Therefore, permit any person to hunt such animal or cause animal to be hunted, provided that no wild animal shall be ordered to be killed unless the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that such animal cannot be captured, tranquilized or translocated. Now, it is uh, and uh, provided further that no such captured animal shall be kept in, in captivity unless the, the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that such animal cannot be rehabilitated in the wild and the reasons for the same are recorded in writing. So, basically section 11 gives a lot of protection to the wildlife. So, if there is an animal that is there in schedule 1 and most of our endangered species are in schedule 1. So, for instance, tiger is a schedule 1 animal, elephant is a schedule 1 animal and so on. So, if there is a schedule 1 animal, it can only be, be, be hunted if the chief wildlife warden gives a permission in writing and also giving the reasons and only under certain circumstances when it becomes dangerous to human life. Now, it is important to note that here it is only human life. If it is doing any amount of property damage, then it cannot be hunted. So, for instance, if there is an elephant that normally raids the, the crop fields of farmers nearby, it cannot be hunted because it is only destroying a property, it is not destroying or it is not yet dangerous to the human life. But if that animal comes out and kills a human being, then when chief wildlife warden, if necessary, may give it the permission. The other reasons are that the animal is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery, then this animal can be uh, hunted down. Now, in this case, the chief wildlife warden also needs to be satisfied that the animal cannot be captured, tranquilized or translocated. So, even in the case of the elephant that has come out and is uh, and has killed a few human beings, 
our first option will be to capture tranquilize and translocate this animal so you take it out of this forest and put it into some other forest so we need to avoid hunting of these schedule 1 animals as much as possible and whenever they are being captured or translocated it should be in a way that uh, so that it causes minimum trauma to the animal now this was in term uh, in the case of schedule 1 animals now in the case of animals in other schedules other than schedule 5 so it includes schedule 2 3 and 4 then if the wild animal has become dangerous to human life or to property including standing crops or any land or the other conditions are the same so essentially schedule 1 animals are given an extra protection they can only be hunted when they are dangerous to human life the other animals can be hunted when they are dangerous to human life or to the property including crops and land so if the elephant was not a schedule 1 animal then it could be possible to to hunt it when it is destroying crops next we have a grant of permit for special purposes now the chief wildlife warden may also grant permit to hunting for purposes including education scientific research scientific management and scientific management in means translocation of animals from one place to another population management of wildlife without killing or poisoning or destroying so essentially if you have a population that is over abundant you cannot just go and kill that those animals to reduce the the population in the name of population management because population management says categorically without killing or poisoning or destroying any wild animals and also collection of specimens also things like uh, snake venom or life saving drugs now all of these things have another uh, category here that provided no such permit shall be granted in respect of any wild animal specified in schedule 1 again we note that schedule 1 is more is the most important animal except with the previous permission of the central government so in the case of schedule 1 animals even if you are giving these permissions there has to be a letter from the central government and in respect of any other wild animal except with the permission uh, except with the previous permission of the state government next if there is a scientist who wants to get into a protected area then there is a restriction of entry for uh, for those people so no person other than a public servant on duty or a person who has been permitted by the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officer to reside within the limits of the sanctuary shall enter or reside in the sanctuary and in accordance with the conditions of the permit granted under section 28 so essentially not everybody can get into a protected area especially a sanctuary and uh, in the case of national parks they also have all of these these provisions that are applicable to those via another section now every person as so long as he resides in the sanctuary is bound to do certain things which include helping the forest officers or the police officers uh, to stop any offenses so the person is required to report any offenses the person is required to help in the extinguishing of any fires and so on next is the grant of permit so whenever the chief wildlife warden is uh, granting permit for scientific research photography tourism and so on then uh, he may may put up certain conditions and may also require the payment of certain fees for the granting of these permits next section 29 says destruction etc in a sanctuary prohibited without a permit no person shall destroy exploit or remove any wildlife including forest produce from a sanctuary or destroy or damage or divert the habitat of any wild animal now when we say destruction in a sanctuary again this term is very wide so like when we saw in the case of pitfall traps that that these traps require you to to dig certain structures in the ground and though these are temporary structures when they when you take them off then uh, these structures are going to leave a mark there in the sanctuary so even that could be be considered in the destruction of the habitat so essentially whenever you are doing anything in a, a protected area especially a sanctuary or a national park you need to have clear cut permissions from the chief wildlife warden or from the authorized officer now when we say authorized officer in most situations the chief wildlife warden has delegated the powers most of these powers to uh, the uh, uh, to the field director of the national park or the wildlife sanctuary so essentially you can even take permissions from the uh, from the field director but only in those cases where the act specifically says 
the chief wildlife warden or his designated officer. In certain situations, it just says the chief wildlife warden only. So, in those cases, uh, th this power cannot be delegated. The definition of destruction is very wide. Now, section 30 says prohibition of entry into sanctuary with a weapon. Now, as we saw uh, earlier in the case of section 2, in the case of definitions, weapon includes a number of things. It includes a tranquilizing gun, it includes an immobilizing gun, it includes any of the traps or snares or nets that you can use to capture a wildlife. So, even entry into the park with any of these weapons is prohibited except with the previous permission in writing of the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officer. So, basically if somebody gets into a national park and states that okay, I am having this net, but I have not captured any wildlife so far. So, it does not mean that the person will be exonerated because uh, in terms of section 30, even entry into the sanctuary with that net is prohibited. Next we have ban on the use of uh, injurious substances section 31 which may cause injury to or endanger any wildlife and this includes chemicals and explosives and other substances. So, basically when we uh, see this section, it also includes all of our drugs that we are using because they may cause injury to or endanger any wildlife. Next we have control of sanctuaries, the chief wildlife warden shall be the authority who shall control, manage and maintain all the sanctuaries and take such measures in the interest of wildlife as he may consider necessary for the improvement of any habitat. So, essentially outsiders do not have any rights in, in these areas, but the chief wildlife warden has all the authority to take any steps that he or she may, may, may find necessary for the improvement of the habitat of the animals, because after all this authority and this responsibility is vested on the chief wildlife warden. Next section 34 states registration of certain persons in possession of arms. So, if there is any person who is residing in or within 10 kilometers of any sanctuary and is holding a licensed arm, then he or she needs to register. So, that these arms are not used for poaching of wildlife under any circumstances. Next, we have uh, declaration of national parks. Now, uh, this section 35 also states that uh, destroying, exploiting or removing of any wildlife including forest is not permitted damaging or uh, destroying or diverting the habitat is not permitted except under and in accordance with the permission granted by the chief wildlife warden. And no such permission shall be granted unless the state government being satisfied in consultation with the national board that such removal of wildlife from the national park or change in the flow of water into or outside the national park is necessary for the improvement and betterment of wildlife therein authorize the issue of such permit. Now, in the case of national parks, we have an added layer of protection that the chief wildlife warden will only grant these permissions when the state government is satisfied and not only the state government has to be satisfied, it has to be satisfied in consultation with the national board. So, essentially you have taken the matters to the central government. Now, the provisions of sections 27 and 28, 32, 32 both inclusive and clauses A, B and C of section 33 and 33A and section 34 shall apply as far as may apply in relation to a national park as they apply in relation to a sanctuary. So, essentially all the protections that were given to a sanctuary are also applicable to a national park. Next we have recognition of zoos, wild animals to be uh, government property. So, uh, wild animal or their meat or any trophy is government property and if now this clause is important any person who obtains by any means the possession of government property shall within 48 hours of obtaining such possession report it to the nearest police station or authorized officer and shall if required hand over such property to the officer in charge of such police station or such authorized officer as the case may be. So, basically if you come in the possession of any government property and here government property means animals, the wild animals, their uh, trophies, their meat, any such thing. If you by any means come into possession of this government property, you need to report it within 48 hours to the nearest police station and maybe even if required hand over such property to the officer in charge. And no person shall without the previous permission in writing of the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officer acquire or keep in his possession custody or control or transfer to any person whether by way of gift, sale or otherwise or destroy or damage such government property. So, basically if you have come into possession of any government property, any 
of these trophies or meat or skin then you can only give it back to the government you you need to report it to the to the police station and hand it over there you are not authorized to keep it with you to give it to any other person whether by gift or sale or anything and you are not even authorized to destroy or damage this government property otherwise it would be considered as an offense next section 48a restricts the transportation of wildlife so without prior permission and section 62 declares certain wild animals to be vermin now in the case of section 62 the central government may by notification declare any wild animal other than those specified in schedule 1 and part 2 of schedule 2 to be a vermin for an area and for such period as may be specified therein and so long as the notification is in force such wild animal shall be deemed to have been included in schedule 5 now in the case of schedule 5 there is a provision that these animals can be hunted the next act that we will consider is the prevention of cruelty to animals act 1960 now it says uh, duties of the persons in charge of the animals so any person who is having a charge of the animals need to follow these provisions you cannot treat an animal cruelly you cannot give it unnecessary pain or suffering now this is not only applicable to the wild animals but it is also applicable to the domestic animals you cannot administer any injurious drug or injurious substance to any animal you cannot convey or carry this animal whether in a vehicle or anything else and subject to unnecessary pain or suffering keep it confined in a cage or any receptacle which does not measure sufficiently in height length and breadth to permit the animal a reasonable opportunity for movement keep the animal for an unreasonable time chained or tethered fail to provide uh, such animal with sufficient food drink or shelter you cannot abandon this animal under circumstances in which it will suffer pain by reason of starvation or thrust or thirst if this animal is suffering from any contagious or infectious diseases you cannot let it loose you cannot mutilate this animal you cannot kill this animal and this is important solely with a view to providing entertainment confine or cause to be confined and any animal including tying of an animal as a bait in a tiger or other sanctuary so as to make it an object of prey to any other animal now this section has been a bit controversial because at times people have used this section to state that no animal can be used as a bait for capturing of any other animal so essentially when you are trying to capture a leopard that has become involved in human wildlife conflict you cannot tie a goat to capture this animal but then this section uh, 17m it clearly states solely with a view to providing entertainment confines or causes to be confined any animal including tying of an animal as a bait so as to make it as an object of prey for any other animal so why does it state like this because in earlier times there were situations in which people used to tie a buffalo in a reserve or a sanctuary now when there is a buffalo or a calf that is tied somewhere then the predator would come there and hunt this animal and this was done solely to provide entertainment to, to the people who were coming there to the tourists who were coming to visit this park and to see how this predator is hunting the animals now solely for the purpose of entertainment this cannot be done but otherwise if you are using an animal as a bait for any other purpose it is permitted under the prevention of cruelty to animals act 1960 then experiments on animals are regulated there is a committee to control and supervise the experiments on animals it also has some duties and responsibilities then there is a power to prohibit experiments on animals and then there are rules that are made under these which are prevention of cruelty capture of animal rules 1972 and transport of animal rules to deal with the transport of monkeys now why is this important because in a number of situations we have observed that monkeys are getting into human wildlife conflict so essentially there are certain temples in which monkeys have been venerated for a number of decades uh, because in India people consider monkeys uh, as to be related to the Lord Hanuman but if these animals are getting into conflict and if uh, the government wants to, to, to transport these monkeys away from residential areas or from these temple surroundings into the forest areas then even these monkeys have protection so they cannot be confined into smaller cages they cannot be, be just uh, put inside in smaller cages in a large number and then translocated you need to be 
extremely mindful that these monkeys are also animals who have a sense, who can suffer, who can uh, suffer from pain and other discomfort. So, whenever these monkeys are being translocated for any reason, then this transportation has to be done in a comfortable manner. So, this is about the prevention of cruelty to animals. Next, we have the Arms Act of 1959. Now, here also section 2 deals with the definitions and when we look at the definitions of arms and firearms, then we can say clearly that the two things. One, arms includes firearms and immobilization guns are firearms as per the definition. So, essentially immobilization guns are firearms and because firearms are included in arms, so immobilization guns are both firearms and arms. So, the provisions of this act are completely act applicable whenever we are using the immobilization guns. Now, in certain areas uh, the rules have been relaxed a bit, but in general you require a license for uh, the possession of firearms and ammunition. You cannot have more than three firearms at any time. Then the manufacturer sale etcetera of these arms and ammunitions requires a license and also import and export of uh, these arms and uh, etcetera are require a license. And then there is power to prohibit import and export of arms by the central government and also a power to restrict or prohibit the transportation of arms. Next we have the provisions of the Indian Electricity Act 2003. Now why is this provision important? Because in a number of situations we have observed that there are people who perform hunting of animals using electricity. So, what they would be doing? If there is a high tension wire, so suppose this wire is carrying 11 kV of uh, electricity, these people would just put up some pegs on the ground and then take a GI wire, pass it like this and then leave it like this. So, when you do, do any such activity, this 11000 volts that was there in the high tension wire is now brought down. So, all this wire is now having a potential of 11 kV. And now, if there is any animal and if this, if there is suppose a water body somewhere there and this animal is using this path to go to the water body. So, as soon as the body of this animal comes into contact with the wire here, so the 11 kV line and this uh, the legs of the animal are connected to the ground. So, when this animal comes here, then this 11 kV potential of the wire and this is uh, ground. So, this is having a 0 volt potential. So, this potential difference of 11000 volts will result in a massive jolt of electricity that goes from the body of this animal and this animal would die. Now, this process of electrocution is being used by, by some people uh, uh, to hunt uh, for smaller animals. Similarly, electricity is also being used to hunt fishes. So, people would just put up these, electri uh, these electric wires into the pond and then pass a high voltage of current through it. So, all of these activities are regulated and in, in a number of cases even banned under the Indian Electricity Act 2003. So, section 135 talks about tapping or making or causing to be made by any connection with overhead, underground or underwater lines or cables. So, this is all prohibited. And if there is any accident that occurs, including the loss of human or animal life or injury to human or animal life, then the person needs to give a notice of occurrence and of any such loss of or injury actually caused by the accident in uh, the form to the electrical inspector of the area. So, that is the Indian Electricity Act. It is not very much applicable in the case of our immobilizations, but yeah, it is important to note that if you are using electricity for any immobilization or for any capturing of animals, then these rules also need to be taken into account. Now, the important act that uh, we need to deal with when immobilizing animals is the Indian Veterinary Council Act of 1984. Now, in this act, section 2 is definitions. So, it says that veterinary medicine means modern scientific veterinary medicine in all its branches and includes veterinary surgery and obstetrics. So, it includes a number of things in the term veterinary medicine. Now, in the case of section 30, it says rights of persons who are enrolled on the Indian veterinary practitioners register, they can hold office and they can practice veterinary medicine. Now, 
why is this important because if you are immobilizing an animal then you are giving some drug to the animal so you are practicing veterinary medicine on that animal now you can only do that if you are enrolled on the indian veterinary practitioners register so essentially you have a license to practice so any person cannot just go and administer the immobilizing drugs or anesthetics to any of the wild animals and also to any other animals but because we are dealing with wildlife conservation whenever anybody is going into the forest area and is trying to immobilize an animal he or she needs to have a license of practice under the indian veterinary council act of 1984 and then it also says that other regulations under the regulation uh, 174 of the veterinary council of india standards of professional conduct etiquettes and code of ethics for veterinary practitioners regulation 1992 will be used now it says that a veterinarian shall use any drug prepared under standard pharmacological principles and shall adopt all necessary preparations and precautions like sterilization and verification of doses as are normally prescribed for that drug now it also means that expired medicines cannot be administered on the wild animals unless the veterinarian thinks that he or she has taken suitable precautions that have been taken to overcome any loss of potency of these drugs but then as a rule expired medicines should not be used on wildlife as far as possible only in the cases of exigencies or emergencies the veterinarian can make an informed decision but that should be the exception not the norm next we have the drugs and cosmetics act of 1940 so it says so section 3 definitions drug includes all medicines for internal or external use of human beings or animals so any immobilizing drug or any anesthetic drug that we are using on a wildlife comes under the control of the drugs and cosmetics act of 1940 and it also includes those devices that are intended for internal and external use in diagnosis treatment mitigation or prevention of disease or disorder so it includes those chemicals and also the devices then it talks about the standards of quality so the all these drugs have to be of a certain standard of quality now next it says there that there is prohibition of import of certain drugs or cosmetics so the central government by notification in the official gazette can uh, regulate or prohibit the import or of certain drugs and cosmetics also to prohibit completely the import of drugs and cosmetics in public interest the the central government can also make rules regarding standards of quality prohibition of manufacture and sale of certain drugs and cosmetics now why is this important because in a number of situations we would hear that in the field there is a dearth of certain drugs but then if there is a demand for those drugs it is not possible for any person to just uh, go ahead and manufacture those drugs so it's not just related to a profit and loss uh, thing or a, a, or a demand and supply rule essentially the central government has the power to regulate the import or manufacturing of any drug or cosmetics in the public interest so it we also have the drugs and cosmetic rules 1940 which talk about import licenses license to sell stock exhibit or offer for sale or distribute these drugs and so on next important act is the narcotic drug and psychotropic substances act 1985 now why is this important because as we in the lecture on immobilization narcotics are a very important category of drugs that we use for the immobilization of animals now it talks uh, this act talks about controlled substances and manufacturing drugs narcotic drugs means coca leaf cannabis hemp opium poppy straw and includes all manufactured goods so essentially when we saw that all of the narcotic drugs that we use for wildlife are morphine or their derivatives and morphine is uh, derived out of opium or poppy so basically all of these are included in under this act and psychotropic substances means any substance natural or synthetic or any natural material or any salt the or preparation of such substance or material included in the list of psychotropic substances now psychotropic substances also include the agents that that perform the role of hallucinogens so they they create hallucination in the animal and those are also used as dissociative anesthetics as we saw in the lecture on uh, immobilization so both narcotics and psychotropic substances are included or are covered under the ambit of this act now the central government can take measures to prevent and combat abuse of and illicit traffic in narcotic drugs 
Now, why is this act important? Because in the case of uh, wildlife conservation, we might require these drugs for conservation of wildlife, for immobilization, for translocation of wildlife. But there are people who can uh, abuse these drugs as a recreational substance. So, which is why it becomes extremely crucial for the government to take measures to prevent and combat abuse and illegal traffic in narcotic drugs. Then it prohibits certain operations and then this act says that not only does the central government permit, control and regulate these drugs, but also the state government. So, this is a power that is also given to the state government and then it talks about the punishments. Now, section 68 j is important, the burden of proof. In any proceedings under this chapter, the burden of proving that any property specified in the notice served under section 68 h is not illegally acquired property shall be on the person affected. So, basically the burden of proof is given on the person that has been in indicted under this act. So, if you are in possession of any of the drugs that are mentioned here, it is your responsibility to prove that you have acquired those drugs legally. So, you have not illegally imported those drugs, you have not illegally manufactured those drugs, you have not taken those drugs illegally from some place, you have not stolen those drugs from some place. So, all of this uh, all of these responsibilities will fall on the person who is found in possession of the drugs. So, which is why it becomes important under section 68 j. Then it also protects action taken in good faith and then state government and central government can make certain rules regarding this. Then you have to apply for a license, import certificate, transit licenses and so on. Now, other acts and rules that are important in the case of immobilization include the Indian Wireless Telegraphy Act of 1933 and the draft guidelines for obtaining unique identification number and operation of civil unmanned aircraft system UAS issued by the office of the director general of civil aviation. So, basically when we talk about immobilization of animals, we also looked at placing of collars on the animals. So, these radio collars that are put on the neck of the animal. So, once you have immobilized the animal, you can put a radio collar to track this animal. Now, because this radio collar makes use of wireless frequencies, so the, uh, the, uh, the Indian Wireless Telegraphy Act of 1933 becomes important here. Now, it says uh, that you have a prohibition of possession of wireless telegraphy apparatus without license. So, you, you need to have a license before you are operating any of these collars. Power of central government to exempt persons from provisions of the act. Then it talks about licenses, power of the central government to make rules. Now, it is important to note that all of these rules are governed by the central government. Next is the use of drones or the unmanned air vehicles UAVs. So, here we have things like issue of unique identification number to all unmanned aircraft. Now, drones are, are increasingly being used these days to locate the animal that needs to be immobilized. So, you can fly a drone into your reserve area and see which is the animal that you want to dart. So, in that case you need to have a unique identification number for your drone, you need to have unmanned aircraft operator permit, the security aspects need to be taken into account training requirements, maintenance of the aircraft and so on. Now, all of these rules uh, are becoming increasingly important these days because we are making use of newer and newer technologies. In the case of drones, it also becomes important because these drones also have the potential to say crash into a wild animal to kill that animal or to crash into the forest area and start a fire. So, essentially a number of insurances, a number of trainings need to be kept in mind the aircraft needs to be, be properly maintained and so on. So, essentially in this lecture, we had a look at a number of acts and rules. So, Indian Forest Act, the Wildlife Protection Act, the rules made under those, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animal Act, the Arms Act, the Indian Electricity Act, the Indian Veterinary Council Act 1984, the Drugs and Cosmetics Act 1940, the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act 1985. Indian Wireless Telegraphy Act 1933, draft guidelines for obtaining unique identification and operation of civil unmanned aircraft system and so on were discussed. Now, it is important to note here that most of these acts and rules are changing with time because we are getting newer and newer technologies, these acts and rules are getting amended. So, whenever there is any 
uh, activity any person who wants to to perform immobilization of wild animals in a reserve area then it makes a lot of sense to go through all of these acts once more to see if there has been any amendment in any of those provisions and whether you have all the the required licenses with you all the required permissions with you so for instance in the case of uh, our narcotic substances and uh, uh, our na narcotics and psychotropic substances act we saw that even if you are in possession of a drug it is your responsibility to prove that uh, you have acquired it legally and there is no hanky panky business that is going on so it is always important to keep in mind that you have all the permissions and you fo are following the, all the laws of the land so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind